Tess of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy, read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter Seventeen. The dairy maids and men had flocked down from their cottages and out of the dairy house with the arrival of the cows from the meads. The maids walking in patterns, not on account of the weather, but to keep their shoes above the mulch of the barton. Each girl sat down on her three-legged stool, her face sideways, her right cheek resting against the cow, and looked musingly along the animal's flank at Tess as she approached. The male milkers, with hat-brims turned down, resting flat on their foreheads and gazing on the ground, did not observe her. One of these was a sturdy, middle-aged man, whose long white pinner was somewhat finer and cleaner than the wraps of the others, and whose jacket underneath had a presentable marketing aspect. The master dairyman of whom she was in quest, his double character as a working milker and butter maker here during six days, and on the seventh, as a man in shining broadcloth in his family pew at church, being so marked as to have inspired a rhyme. Dairy Man Dick all the week. On Sundays, Mr. Richard Crick. Seeing Tess standing at gaze, he went across to her. The majority of dairy men have a cross manner at milking time, but it happened that Mr. Crick was glad to get a new hand, for the days were busy ones now, and he received her warmly, inquiring for her mother and the rest of the family, though this as a matter of form merely, for in reality he had not been aware of Mrs. Durbeyfield's existence till appraised of the fact by a brief business letter about Tess. "'Oh, I, as a lad, I knowed your part of the country very well,' he said terminatively, "'though I've never been there since. "'And a aged woman of ninety that used to live nigh here, "'but is dead and long gone, "'told me that a family of some such name as yours in Blackmore Vale "'came originally from these parts.' and that twere an old ancient race that had all but perished off the earth, though the new generations didn't know it. But, Lord, I took no notice of the old woman's ramblings, not I. Oh, no, it is nothing, said Tess. Then the talk was of business only. You can milk em clean, my maidy. I don't want my cows going a zoo at this time of year. She reassured him on that point, and he surveyed her up and down. She had been staying indoors a good deal, and her complexion had grown delicate. "'Quite sure you can stand it. "'Tis comfortable enough here for rough folk, but we don't live in a cowcumber frame.' She declared that she could stand it, and her zest and willingness seemed to win him over. "'Well, I suppose you'll want a dish of tea or victuals of some sort, hey? "'Not yet. Well, do as ye like about it. "'But, faith, if twas I, I should be as dry as a kex we travelling so far.' "'I'll begin milking now to get my hand in,' said Tess. "'She drank a little milk as temporary refreshment to the surprise— indeed slight contempt of dairyman Crick, to whose mind it had apparently never occurred that milk was good as a beverage. "'Oh, if ye can swallow that, be it so,' he said indifferently, while a milker held up the pail that she sipped from. "'Tis what I hate touched for years, not I. Rot the stuff! It would lie in my innards like lead.' "'You can try your hand upon she,' he pursued, nodding to the nearest cow. "'Not but what she do milk rather hard. "'We've hard ones and we've easy ones, like other folks. "'However, you'll find out that soon enough.' "'When Tess had changed her bonnet for a hood, 
and was really on her stool under the cow, and the milk was squirting from her fists into the pail, she appeared to feel that she had really laid a new foundation for her future. The conviction bred serenity. Her pulse slowed, and she was able to look about her. The milkers formed quite a little battalion of men and maids, the men operating on the hard-teated animals, the maids on the kindlier natures. It was a large dairy. There were nearly a hundred milchers under Crick's management, all told, and of the herd the master dairyman milked six or eight with his own hands, unless away from home. These were the cows that milked hardest of all. For his journey milkman, being more or less casually hired, he would not entrust this half-dozen to their treatment, lest, from indifference, they should not milk them fully, nor to the maids, lest they should fail in the same way for lack of finger-grip, with the result that in course of time the cows would go a zoo, that is, dry up. It was not the loss for the moment that made slack milking so serious, but that with the decline of the demand there came a decline, and ultimately cessation, of supply. After Tess had settled down to her cow, there was for a time no talk in the barton, and not a sound inferred with the purr of the milk-jets into the numerous pails, except a momentary exclamation to one or other of the beasts, requesting her to turn around, or stand still. The only movements were those of the milkers' hands up and down, and the swing of the cows' tails. Thus they all worked on, encompassed by the vast flat mead which extended to either slope of the valley, a level landscape, compounded of old landscapes long forgotten, and no doubt differing in character very greatly from the landscape they composed now. "'To my thinking,' said the dairyman, rising suddenly from a cow he had just finished off, snatching up his three-legged stool in one hand and the pail in the other, and moving on to the next hard yielder in his vicinity. "'To my thinking, the cows don't gee down their milk to-day as usual. Upon my life, if Winkler do begin keeping back like this, she'll not be worth going under by midsummer.' "'Tis because there's a new hand come among us,' said Jonathan Cale. "'I've noticed such things afore.' "'To be sure, it may be so. I didn't think on't. "'I've been told that it goes up into their horns at such times,' said a dairymaid. "'Well, as to going up into their horns,' replied Dairyman Crick dubiously, as though even witchcraft may be limited by anatomical possibilities, I couldn't say, I certainly could not. But as nut-cows will keep it back as well as the horned ones, I don't quite agree to it. Do you know that riddle about the nut-cows, Jonathan? Why do nut-cows give less milk in a year than horned? I don't, interposed the milkmaid, why do they? Because there bain't so many of em, said the dairyman. Howsomever, these gamesters do certainly keep back their milk to-day. Folks, we must lift up a stave or two. That's the only cure for it. Songs were often resorted to in dairies hereabout as an enticement to the cows when they showed signs of withholding their usual yield and the band of milkers at this request burst into melody, in purely business-like tones, it is true, and with no great spontaneity, the result, according to their own belief, being a decided improvement during the song's continuance. When they had gone through fourteen or fifteen verses of a cheerful ballad about a murderer who was afraid to go to bed in the dark because he saw certain brimstone flames around him, one of the male milkers said, "'I wish singing on the stoop didn't use up so much of a man's wind. You should get your harp, sir. 
Not but what a fiddle is best. Tess, who had given an ear to this, thought the words were addressed to the dairyman, but she was wrong. A reply, in the shape of why, came as it were out of the belly of a dun cow in the stalls. It had been spoken by a milker behind the animal, whom she had not hitherto perceived. Oh, yes, there's nothing like a fiddle, said the dairyman. "'though I do think that bulls are more moved by a tune than cows. "'At least that's my experience. "'Once there was an old aged man over at Melstock, "'William Dewey by name, "'one of the family that used to do a good deal of business as tranters over there. "'Jonathan, do you mind? "'I knowed the man by sight as well as I knowed my own brother, "'in a manner of speaking. "'Well, this man was a-coming home along from a wedding where he had been playing his fiddle one fine moonlit night, and for shortness' sake he took a cut across forty acres, a field lying that way, where a bull was out to grass. The bull seed William and took after him, horns a ground begad, and though William runned his best and hadn't much to drink in him, considering twas a wedding and the folks well off, he found he'd never reach the fence and get over in time to save himself. Well, as a last thought, he pulled out his fiddle as he runned, and struck up a jig, turning to the bull and backing toward the corner. The bull softened down and stood up, looking hard at William Dewey, who fiddled on and on, till a sort of a smile stole over the bull's face. But no sooner did William stop his playing and turn to get over a hedge than the bull would stop his smiling and lower his horns toward the seat of William's breeches. Well, William had to turn about and play on willy nilly, and it was only three o'clock in the world, and I knowed that nobody would come that way for hours, and he so leery and tired that I didn't know what to do. When he had scraped till about four o'clock, he felt that he verily would have to give over soon, and he said to himself, There's only this last tune between me and eternal welfare. Heaven save me, or I'm a done man. Well, then he called to mind how he'd seen cattle kneel o' Christmas Eve's in the dead of night. It was not Christmas Eve then, but it came into his head to play a trick upon the bull. So he broke into the tivity hymn, just as at Christmas carol singing, and lo and behold, down went the bull on his bended knees, in his ignorance, just as if twere true tivity night and hour. As soon as his horned friend were down, William turned, clinked off like a long dog, and jumped safe over a hedge before the praying bull had got to his feet again to take after him. William used to say that he'd seen a man look a fool a good many times, but he'd never seen such a fool as that bull looked when he found his pious feelings had been played upon, and was not Christmas Eve. Yes, William Dewey, that was the man's name— and I can tell you to a foot where he's a-lying in Melstock churchyard at this very moment, just between the second yew-tree and the north aisle. It's a curious story. It takes us back to medieval times when faith was a living thing. The remark, singular for a dairy-yard, was murmured by the voice behind the dun cow, but as nobody understood the reference— no notice was taken, except that the narrator seemed to think it might imply a scepticism as to his tale. "'Well, tis quite true, sir, whether or no. I know the man well.' "'Oh, yes, I have no doubt of it,' said the person behind the dun cow. Tess's attention was thus attracted to the dairyman's interlocutor, of whom she could see but the merest patch— owing to his burying his head so persistently in the flank of the milcher. She could not understand why he should be addressed as Sir, even by the dairyman himself. But no explanation was discernible, 
He remained under the cow long enough to have milked three, uttering a private ejaculation now and then, as if he could not get on. "'Take it gentle, sir, take it gentle,' said the dairyman. "'Tis knack, not strength, that does it.' "'So I find,' said the other, standing up at last and stretching his arms. "'I think I have finished her, however, though she made my fingers ache.' Tess could then see him at full length. He wore the ordinary white pinner and leather leggings of a dairy farmer when milking, and his boots were clogged with the mulch of the yard. But this was all his local livery. Beneath it was something educated, reserved, subtle, sad, differing. But the details of his aspect were temporarily thrust aside by the discovery that he was the one whom she had seen before. Such vicissitudes had Tess passed through since that time that for a moment she could not remember where she had met him, and then it flashed upon her that he was the pedestrian who had joined at the club dance at Marlott. The passing stranger who had come she knew not whence had danced with others but not with her, had slightly left her, and gone on his way with his friends. The flood of memories brought back by this revival of an incident anterior to her troubles produced a momentary dismay, lest, recognizing her also, he should by some means discover her story. But it passed away when she found no sign of remembrance in him. She saw by degrees that since her first and only encounter his mobile face had grown more thoughtful, and had acquired a young man's shapely moustache and beard, the latter of the palest straw colour where it began upon his cheeks, and deepening to a warm brown further from its root. Under his linen milking pinner he wore a dark velveteen jacket, cord breeches and gaiters, and a starched white shirt. Without the milking gear nobody could have guessed what he was. He might, with equal probability, have been an eccentric landowner, or a gentlemanly ploughman. That he was but a novice at dairy work she had realized in a moment, from the time he had spent upon the milking of one cow. Meanwhile many of the milkmaids had said to one another of the newcomer, how pretty she is, with something of real generosity and admiration, though with half a hope that the auditors would qualify the assertion, which, strictly speaking, they might have done, prettiness being an inexact definition of what struck the eye in Tess. When the milking was finished for the evening, they straggled indoors, where Mrs. Crick, the dairyman's wife, who was too respectable to go out milking herself, and wore a hot stuff gown in warm weather, because the dairymaids wore prints, was giving an eye to the leads and things. Only two or three of the maids, Tess learned, slept in the dairy house besides herself, most of the helpers going to their homes. She saw nothing at supper-time of the superior milker who had commented on the story, and asked no questions about him, the remainder of the evening being occupied in arranging her place in the bedchamber. It was a large room over the milk-house, some thirty feet long, the sleeping-cots of the other three indoor milkmaids being in the same apartment. They were blooming young women, and, except one, rather older than herself. By bedtime Tess was thoroughly tired, and fell asleep immediately. But one of the girls who occupied an adjoining bed was more wakeful than Tess, and would insist upon relating to the latter various particulars of the homestead into which she had just entered. The girls' whispered words mingled with the shades, and, to Tess's drowsy mind, they seemed to be generated by the darkness in which they floated. "'Mr. Angel Clare, he that is learning milking, and that plays the harp, never says much to us. He is a parson's son, and is too much taken with his own thoughts to notice girls. He is the dairyman's pupil, 
learned farming in all its branches. He has learned sheep farming in another place, and he's now mastering dairy work. Yes, he is quite the gentleman born. His father is the Reverend Mr. Clara M. Minster, a good many miles from here. Oh, I have heard of him, said her companion, now awake. A very earnest clergyman, is he not? Yes, that he is, the earnestest man in all Wessex, they say, the last of the low church sort, they tell me, for all about here be what they call high. All his sons, except our Mr. Clare, be made parsons too. Tess had not, at this hour, the curiosity to ask why the present Mr. Clare was not made a parson like his brethren, and gradually fell asleep again, the words of her informant coming to her along with the smell of the cheeses in the adjacent cheese-loft, and the measured dripping of the whey from the rings downstairs. End of chapter 17